Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Hello? Okay, let's go. Learning time, preemptive like. Phones away, toss them, even if you're watching on one. Throw it. My name's Connor. First video of the day, still waking up, but I'm, I'm good to go. Original link to the video, top of the description, below that link to the Discord. Click on it, send you right over there. We'd love to have you. Let's do it. The man who invented Germany, the life and times of Otto von Bismarck. One of my favorite historical figures I've learned about over this past year plus. Yeah, awesome. Let's go with Jack Rackham. Awesome video, awesome channel. Germany's kind of a big deal, right? Sort of the unofficial point person of the EU. Biggest economy in Europe by a substantial margin. I didn't even realize how much of a heavyweight they were until I started fact-checking for this video. Not to mention it was at the center of two world wars. The weird thing is, unlike England and France, which have been around for, what, a thousand years? Germany is younger than the United States. For most of history, Germany didn't exist. There were Germans, but no Germany. The closest thing was the Holy Roman Empire, which if we're talking about maybe the Autonians, it was sort of synonymous with a great big mostly German kingdom, but eh, it got looser and looser as it went on, and by the beginning of the 1800s, the map of Europe looked like this. Northern Europe looks almost identical to today. Western Europe as well, if you ignore France getting a little glommy with the Low Countries and Italy. Oh, this is a little spicy. The Ottomans are still in the Balkans, and Austria's got a big old empire and then oh my god what happened here someone made scrambled eggs out of germany that was the holy roman empire a thousand tiny independent states loosely united under the emperor but look at these two Prussia and Austria were both doing the hokey pokey with one foot in and one foot out and despite being part of the same empire wasn't saxony kind of a third like not as strong as prussia or austria but stronger than other Okay. spent the pokey with one foot in and one foot out, and despite being part of the same empire, they spent the last 60 years as each other's arch nemeses. So when Napoleon came along in 1806 and broke apart the Holy Roman Empire, even though Napoleon eventually lost, no one really cared enough to put it back together. Not even the emperor himself. But Napo <laughs> Napoleon did lose, and so what we're left with in 1815 is the German Confederation which was kind of like the Holy Roman Empire, except even weaker. The question was, who was really going to be in charge of the Germans? Austria was an ancient power with a network of alliances Screw stretching you. the continent. Prussia. But Prussia was the up-and-coming great power with one of the most effective militaries in the world, thanks in part to the efforts of one sporting Frederick. young man in a dapper jacket and a penchant for war who decided to keep living long enough to become one of the most influential men of his century. But the man who invented Germany, Frederick the Great's spiritual successor of sorts, wasn't an ambitious king who made up his mind to conquer everything, Otto. or a forward-thinking revolutionary who found a way to make everybody get along. He was a conservative politician who originally wanted nothing to do with it. Let's go. Thanks to Kingdom Maker for sponsoring this video. Pay attention. Ooh, Kingdom Maker. Do they have a do they have a link? Guys, make sure to if you're doing any of this stuff, make sure you use their links, alright? Video. Alas! Oh boo hoo! Boo hoo hoo hoo! What's the matter, Bismarck, old chum? I was born in the wrong generation, Gottfried. I yearn for the good old medieval days. But you're a politician, not a king. Your job didn't exist back then. Yes, those were the days. Now I can only take solace in old books and Kingdom Maker, my favorite free-to-play app on iOS and Android. Whatever became of the good <laughs> old days when players I you had royalty me. could battle, boink, and betray their way to glory. Boink. boink. Oh yes, any old fool can send young men to die on the battlefield. It takes a real strategist to make love and war. Back when you could breed noblemen and send them dungeon crawling for fat loot and sacrifice the ones you didn't like into a volcano. Alas, these days the only place one can yes. find a combination of grand real-time strategy, RPG, and sim gameplay in a charming, charismatic package is in the hours of unfolding content of Kingdom Maker. Available What's for free in the link below. Bismarck's story begins.
What was that game that looks just like that? Okay, sorry. ...content of Kingdom Maker, available for free in the link below. Bismarck's story begins in 1848, which is probably one of the biggest single years in European history. I thought Not 49. because of any singular event, but because of a lot of little events, and some kind of big events. All around Europe, the middle and working classes were kind of like, Hey, it's 1848, we've got steam engines and junk, what's all this feudalism still doing here? And so there's all these revolutions everywhere, where people are rising up for democracy, democracy and freedom of the press and an end to serfdom and workers rights and Bismarck is sort of this little brown-nosed kid who is actually 33 living in his private country estate trying to rally his peasants declaring you don't want democracy in his private country estate trying to rally his peasants to there may come a day without a king but today is not that declaring day. you don't want democracy anyway Come, let's rise up against the tyranny of the working class. Let's go to Berlin and quash those naughty rabble-rousers in the name of the king. The liberal movement in 1848 kind of runs out of steam because they got a few concessions from the king, which ultimately amounted to a limited constitution and a three estate style parliament where 80% of the population got one third of the vote because they watched my video on Louis XVI and saw how well that idea worked for France. And also they fell really short because they wanted to create a united Germany and it turns out that's really hard actually. But that meant when Bismarck got elected to parliament, he got a bunch of brownie points for siding with the king, which was a great start. To start a war with France, and then everyone will go on your side in defense. Parliament, he got a bunch of brownie points for siding with the king, which was a great start to his political career. Then the king died and got replaced by a liberal-er king who sidelined Bismarck for a few years, but then he died and a conservative-er king came to power. The conservative-er king Wilhelm I got into a shouting match with Parliament over the annual budget. Basically, he wanted more money going into the army, and he wanted to keep the service length at three years instead of two. And he thought to himself, Ah, oh, if only I had a conservative ally in Parliament that I could give a boatload of political power to in order to push through my agenda. You do? Oh, wait! So Bismarck becomes prime minister and walks into parliament like, So if you don't approve a budget this year, we're gonna be forced to keep using the old one, which also means three year service. So give us a better budget! Oh no, this is the budget. You can take it, or leave it. Give me this stupid budget. How was that? <laughs> Legally dubious, but very clever. I don't know how I can ever thank you enough. Complete control over foreign policy for the next 30 years. What? <laughs> Luckily for the king, Bismarck was still a devout monarchist and wasn't about to pull a coup or anything. He mostly just got his way by being the best at his job and threatening to quit if the king didn't do things his way. Now at this point, he had actually warmed up to the idea of German unification as long as Prussia got to be more important than Austria. Within his first year in office, he quite famously gave a speech saying that words failed to unite Germany in 1848. Now he would unite Germany with blood and iron. He teamed up with a guy named Rune, Roan, who reorganized the army, and a guy named Moltke, the military strategist who thought real good Moltke. good about how to kill people. With their powers combined, Bismarck wanted to take advantage of the fact that the traditional alliances that held Europe together since the defeat of Napoleon were a little shaky ever since the Crimean War. But instead of pulling a Napoleon going, this is the way the world is gonna be, you got a problem with that, come at me bro! Why is he Italian? <laughs> This is the way they're gonna be, okay. Bismarck was going to be very careful in picking his fights. He began with a simple succession dispute in Denmark over who should inherit Just the duchies Holstein? bordering what would eventually become Germany. Nothing wrong with that, right? Look, even Austria is helping him. See? Bismarck wins the war for one side, but makes a bunch of impossible demands and takes over the land for Prussia. But no fight. Oh, look, they're sharing it with Austria. Look at them. Isn't that cute? Prussia's such a good friend. But oh no, Austria's land is farther away from their empire and they have to cross through Prussia to get it and oh geez things are getting oh real no I could never foresee this how is this happening he is a genius genius maybe the most genius genius politically at, at maybe you know militarily genius people like Hannibal but politically genius people I think Otto takes the cake and it's not even close 
defense. Who could have predicted this? Oh. Well, Austria got real mad and broke their promise, so now poor Prussia has to declare war because they're the ones being swindled. Surely the rest of Europe can Surely. understand. Now you might be wondering, what does a war with Austria over land in Denmark have to do with German unification? Well, now... Remember the German Confederation? Although the little German states were split between who supported I want to sound smart and explain supported Prussia and who supported Austria, officially the German Confederation was supposed to all declare war on Prussia. So Bismarck said, "Bugger that, you're not allowed to attack me. In fact, you're not allowed to exist anymore." 7 weeks later, Prussia won the war, the confederation was gone and replaced by the North German Con Wait, hold on. I actually I actually need to go back. German unification. Good question. Remember the German Confederation? Yes. Although the little German states were split between who supported Prussia and who supported Austria, officially the German Confederation was supposed to all declare war on Prussia. So Bismarck said, bugger that, you're not allowed to attack me. In fact, you're not allowed to exist anymore. Why? Why? Why is that the case? Austria, officially the German Confederation was supposed to all declare war on Prussia. Why? What? I understand. So Bismarck said, bugger that, you're not allowed to attack me. In fact, you're not allowed to exist anymore. Seven weeks later, Prussia won the war, the confederation was gone, and replaced by the North German Confederation. The states that allied with Prussia were technically independent, while the states that fought against Prussia all got annexed. And then there was Luxembourg and Liechtenstein, who stayed neutral and are still out there vibing to this day. So now we've got kinda sorta Germany, big mega block of German states all smooshed together and controlled by Prussia. But it looks like this, and the Germany you've probably seen in World War I looks like this. And it would only take one- And what I love even more about this period is that two of my favorite figures in history are in it. Otto von Bismarck and Napoleon III. They're both in it. They're both a part of it which makes the Franco-Prussian War one of my favorite that I've learned about, and I still know very little, but I've loved every minute of it so far. And uh, it's, it's my favorite head-to-head -head in history. Napoleon III, Otto, my two favorite 19th century people, and, uh, and Napoleon, you know, the, the OG Napoleon, but these two more war. This time, Bismarck would take over Germany by attacking France. Or technically, by getting France to attack him. It went like this. Genius. King Wilhelm is going for his morning stroll before visiting the spa, and a French diplomat walks up Guys, to Guys, pay attention here. Pay attention here, because I'm still not 100% fully on this part. And it's a little bit confusing, but it's really good. And so, ready? Pay attention. Or technically, by getting France to attack him. It went like this. King Wilhelm is going for his morning stroll before visiting the spa, and a French diplomat walks up to him. He says, Pardon me, your majesty, but as you know, a distant cousin of yours was briefly considered for the throne of Spain. He's since renounced any claim, but the foreign minister would like your assurance that you won't be supporting any members of your house for the Spanish crown. I beg your pardon, sir. Of course I'm sympathetic to his concerns, but I'm afraid I'm not in a position to bind myself to a particular course of action for the indefinite future, you must understand. Of course, I'll bring him your answer. Now, it was Bismarck's job to inform the press of what went on that day, and the way he- <laughs> And? He told it was more like this. Hello, you hobgoblin, listen up. We get to say what happens in Spain, and if you don't like it, you can eat my pants. Back off before we flatten your silly little country into the stinky German dirt. Pack my lunch, you slug-guzzling stocking sniffer! So all the French were mad at the Germans, and all the Germans were mad at the French. Then, when Bismarck and friends kicked the French's butts, the German states in the south it's also- It's literally like- if you have two friends, but there's a friend I don't, you don't really like, and you want the other friend to not like them, and so you send a text from one of them, their, your friends, acting as the friend, as mad at the other friend. I'm explaining this terribly. Never mind. Forget. Fail. Forget what I said. Then, when Bismarck and friends kicked the French's butts, the German states in the south all said, Wow, wow you're, you're so, so cool! cool. I I wish we were, were part, part of Germany. Germany! And they all hopped on board, and the North German Confederation became the Empire of Germany. Huh. I thought, um... Okay, I learned something again. 
I thought that the southern German states... I thought the plan was to, like, scare the southern German states, uh, be afraid of, of France, and so go over to the Germans before the conflict, but in fact it was to, like, put on a show to the southern German states that, like, you're very powerful and much more powerful than France, and so they beat them first. And then they came onto the confeder into the empire. Interesting. And King Wilhelm became Emperor Wilhelm, or Kaiser Wilhelm the first. And just to add His insult son. to injury, they named him Emperor in Versailles just a few months after the French Emperor lost his title. Oh, now I love you, Napoleon. It's okay. All that was left was to turn Germany into a major player. I mean, Prussia was already a great power, but you know, a major. This is where World War One. Uh, I have trouble because can you blame Germany for outlashing in World War I? I don't know if you can because, look, I know World War I has started with Franz Ferdinand and, and Russia, but I don't like to say, like, World War I started be because of Serbia or because of Austria. I, I think that that was a regional conflict like a lot of other regional conflicts that probably happened and wouldn't have and could have easily been an assassination that just like had a quick conflict between two Balkan nations or or Austria and a Balkan nation or whatever but because of all the alliances it seems like that was just like an arbitrary thing like yeah the the kaiser was assassinated Russia's going to go to to Serbia's defense Germany's going to go to Austria's defense France and Britain are going to go to, are going to fight Germany and go to Russia's defense. Like, so everyone's going in, and then the, a few years later, like always, America is late to the party. So, um, what was my point? Oh, yeah. Uh, so Germany, I, I, they're, they're up and coming, okay? And you have the very powerful countries of France and the UK. I want to say especially the UK um, at this point. You know, mid-1800s, late-1800s is when I think of, like, the zenith of uh, the British Empire. Although it might not be, maybe sometime in, like, the early tw 1920s might have been the territorial zenith, like, the most territory. But I don't think that that means that they were the most powerful um, relative to other, other nations. But at this time, they definitely were. And Germany, through the Industrial Revolution and, and, and connecting into the German em Empire, wants to be, rightfully, they're very they're powerful. They want to be seen as a country like Great Britain, like France. Um, they're, they are easily as powerful um, or close. And so World War I, you can't... I have a lot of sympathy for Germany in World War I. That's what I have to say. Majorer player. He tried to get German Catholics to stop voting by arresting all of their bishops. That went about as well as you'd expect. He tried to Germanize the non-Germans living in his- Wait, what? ...to turn Germany into a month after the French emperor lost his title. Now all that was left was to turn Germany into a major player. I mean, Prussia was already a great power, but you know, a majorer player. He tried to get German Catholics to stop voting by arresting all of their bishops. That went about as well as you'd expect. He tried to Germanize the non-Germans living in his empire. What happened? What do you mean, went as well as you'd expect? And there's a whole debate to be had over the pros and cons of nationalism and the idea of the nation-state. He cracked down on socialism while at the same time creating the first modern welfare state, an achievement which I am entirely downplaying in the interest of time because foreign policy is Bismarck's bread and butter. Bismarck was exceptional at I the first the idea of the nation-state. He cracked down on socialism while- And I didn't think I could love Bismarck any more than I already do. While at the same time creating the first modern welfare state, ah. an achievement which I am entirely downplaying in the interest of time because foreign policy is Bismarck's bread and butter. 
Bismarck was exceptional at eyeing when other states was were a weak lot of and ready to be taken advantage of, and still convincing them into being the ones to declare war on him, but he was just as good at determining when another state's best interests were in line with his, and avoiding war. It feels very prophetic that when a crisis in the Balkans emerged in 1885, Bismarck had the foresight to warn about, quote, plunging Europe from Moscow to the Pyrenees and from the North Sea to Palermo into a war whose issue no man can foresee. See. At the end of the conflict, we should scarcely know why we had fought. So I get it, you know, this is a foreshadowing, like he's he's seeing World War I in the distance, but again, how would he know it would be the Balkans that plunge Europe into World War to into World War One, the Great War. World War One. And when did all of the treaties form that that were the, all of the alliances and treaties that were in place before World War I that led to the domino effect of going into the war. When were all of those treaties, kind of all those treaties and alliances, uh, s cemented, um, instituted? You know, w when were they first? Because if they were already instituted, and well known in 1885, and the Balkans were a flashpoint with a lot of conflict, then yeah, I can see him predicting that. And remember that time Europe got together and decided to carve up Africa? That Good was time. Bismarck's doing when he all of a sudden decided that colonies weren't a waste of money anymore. There was just one thing Bismarck hadn't counted on. King Wilhelm I died in 1888, and his successor, Friedrich III, was 16 years younger than Bismarck. And how does it go from from first to third to second? So Wilhelm, well, so sorry, no, his grandson is the one I was talking about. So his son, so he's Wilhelm the first. Kaiser Wilhelm the third is his son, and then his grandson is Wilhelm the second. Bismarck was already a 73-year-old man, so he would be working with this new king for the rest of his life. Nope, the king died in 99 days. And his and successor, this freaking guy, on Kaiser Wilhelm II, nah. shared Bismarck's passion for participating in government, but not his aptitude. The two fought frequently, and Bismarck was politely asked to resign, while Wilhelm II led the empire towards <laughs> World War I. With nothing else to do in his old age, Bismarck wrote memoirs with the primary objective of dissing the emperor, and then died. War was politely asked. This is a topic I still don't know a lot about, but I have an enormous amount to say, which I will say. Wilhelm II shared Bismarck's passion for participating in government, but not his aptitude. So, when I first learned about Wilhelm II, I'm like, oh my god, oh, let me tell my story. I always, I haven't brought this up in a while. My favorite uh, paper. I ever I ever writ wrote I I had ever written I ever had I was ever assigned my favorite essay I was ever assigned in college was when I left it wasn't at St John's in New York it was at Providence College and it, it it was like an exercise you know World War One is a famously not clear cut who was responsible for really starting it right um. We know the flashpoint, the assassination, um, but in terms of like really whose fault is it for the world war, for it delving into a great world war? And the assignment was, um, you know, even like you can't pick, well, it's really complicated and there really isn't anyone. You have to pick someone. And I think that was a good part of the exercise. And and, and then give your case for why you believe that country might have been the most most uh, causation of it falling into a world war, right? And at the time, I picked Germany. And I think if I, re if I had to write it again today, I still don't know for sure. Obviously, it's very complicated. But I would still pick Germany. Because it seemed like Germany... Like, I, I, so I sympathize with the reason why they were upset 
and why Wilhelm II was acting the way he did. Or, no, no, sorry. And why he wanted... Yeah, why he acted the way he did. I understand that reason, and I sympathize with it. You need... The only way the big daddy powers of the world, France and Britain, are going to listen to you, and I guess you can include Russia, sort of. But, I mean, the big powers in the world are France and Britain. I think, can we all agree on that? Like, that's like the Soviet Union, USA in the 70s and 60s. Um, like, they're the big two. And when you are coming up, kind of like China today, where you've, you've been disrespected, for, like, never been seen for so long, and I can, don't get me, I can get into China and a lot of the stuff they're doing with the Uyghurs and stuff. I'm not trying to, I'm not going to go into that stuff right now. But uh, I, I know they're not doing bad, they're doing a lot of bad stuff. But uh, that, my point stands. is It's kind of like China and how... China's never really been taken seriously as a top, top power. And now, in the past few decades, they're sort of earning that. They, through their economy, their, their industry, their, their um, reach around the world is getting bigger. I know they're doing a lot of stuff in Africa. Um, and uh, the big, like, Silk Road 2.0 thing. And, and I and they deserve respect, and and the only way they're going to get it is through force with the United States. And I don't know when that's going to happen, or if. I mean, the future is hard to tell. But it, like, I get it. But the way that Wilhelm II went about, you know, getting respect is what I see as foolish and very much contributed to the start of the war, and that although Germany didn't start the thing in the Balkans and weren't even the first to mobilize troops, I think that was Russia, they weren't the first to declare like, hey, I'm backing Serbia or Austria, that was Russia. Um, you could say Austria, but I almost like, I almost like, like discount Austria or Serbia. I, I almost feel like they can't really be the, the cause of the world war because there was a conflict in between them with, you know, Serbia, Serbian nationals, whether it was connected to the government or if they were just a bunch of random Serbians that ended up um, killing Archduke Franz Ferdinand. I'm, I'm not sure. But I can't really blame either of those two because that could have just stayed a regional conflict. And so the only ones I can blame for a world war are the ones after it's like maybe Russia or Germany are the biggest maybe contenders. And I'd still go with Germany because just of how Wilhelm II acted. Um, I'm still learning. I don't know enough, but from what I have learned, he was so recklessly trying to get his attention and, like, calling for a fight. And I, I think he could have done it a bit more Otto von Bismarcky. And I'm not saying that you don't use force and, you know, iron and blood and to get what you want. But do it in a more professional way, rather than more of a, like, a teenager going to the gym and, and you're just like, yeah, fight me. You know what I mean? And that, that's my... Dude. The two fought frequently, and Bismarck was politely asked to resign, while Wilhelm II led the empire towards World War I. With nothing else to do in his old age, Bismarck wrote memoirs with the primary objective of dissing the Emperor. What's so sad is that there wasn't another, you know, Bismarck, a man only lived so long, and even in his later years, just like in his very early years, when you're too young or you can be too old, there, there had to have been more than one Bismarck to really secure a future of Germany as a world number one, number two, number three power and not recklessly jump into a world war that you eventually lose. Not that they would have known that. And, um, yeah, it makes me sad whenever we get to this point in his old age and Wilhelm II not listening to him. Um, if only he could live, just, just give him another life, you know, just set him back to like 30 years old and let him live one more time with vigor and talk and keeping the 
the new Kaiser in check, which I'm not sure if he would be able to even in younger age. But uh, man, what the 21st century, what the 20th century could have been if this man got more of what he wanted, I think would have been better. Impossible to tell, but I went on a while ranting. If you're still here, let me know. Type in like 64 11 1 2. So I know you stayed here. If you did, I love you. All right. I hope you're doing well. Chin up. If not, you'll be good soon. Don't worry. Smile. Bye, guys.